Hi folks, I'm glad you could join me uh, for this uh, series of lectures on uh, Judaism and trying to understand Jesus in Judaism. Um, I've, I've got about three lectures I'm going to try to make and uh, keep each of them under 15 or 20 minutes if I can. They may be a little longer, we'll see. I'm, I'm a bit long-winded, but um, I, I hope you enjoy. I'm going to go ahead and um, close out the cam uh, right now and uh, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on the, uh, uh, the lecture, okay? Now, the, the first thing we need to recall about Jesus is that he was Jewish. Um, a lot of times we have Christianized him. We've, we think of Jesus with a lot of Gentile characteristics, and I think in part that has something to do with the Gospels themselves which were written by Gentiles largely for a Gentile audience, from what we can tell. Um, so already the picture we get of Jesus is a little bit skewed because um, I'm not sure that the Gentiles quite understood the mention of Jesus' Jewishness. But Jesus was a Jew. He lived in first century Palestine. So we've got to do um, a real sort of... Um, a, cultural analysis in order to understand the milieu in which he lived and how that shaped um, Jesus' views and the views of the earliest uh, followers of Jesus, the disciples and, and Paul. Of course, um, the main distinction for um, first century Judaism, um, as opposed to Greco-Roman paganism, is that um, Jews worshipped only one God. So their uh, monotheism is, is distinctive um, in the Greco-Roman world, where most um, pagans were polytheistic, mixed and matched, took different gods at different times. Um, and Judaism stood out because it was polytheistic and it demanded um, uh, exclusive worship of one god, of Yahweh. And that exclusivity would have been very different from the pagans who really, you know, one god, two gods, three gods, whatever. They would mix and match. And, and so the Jews were viewed by the pagans really almost as atheists. Because if you don't believe in all the gods and you only believe in one god, you might as well believe in no god. And they were considered then a threat a lot of times, because the social order and, and the economic order and everything else was maintained by the gods. And so not worshiping the gods um, put uh, um, uh, the community in the eyes of the ancients in a precarious position. Um, so the Jews were, were disdained, disliked for their beliefs. And because they maintained purity laws and did some other things, they, they kept it themselves. And so... Um, it was a very distinctive culture and religion in its day. We can talk about four elements um, that are significant uh, for second example of Judaism. First is the idea that they've got this covenant from Yahweh, that God selected them to make them into uh, a people. Second is that it is already a religion of the book. Um, by the first century, the law anyway, the Torah and the prophets, um, are pretty stable and are being used by Jews both in Jew in Palestine as well as outside of um, Judea um, as as a central understanding for their beliefs. The third element of Judaism for first century Palestine dominant element is the worship of the temple and the sacrificial system. And then the fourth is just the belief that the Jewish Holy Land is different than every other land on earth. It's God's chosen place where God has chosen to dwell. And so um, the land, Israel, is different than, um, um, than, than any other land in the world. Now, in terms of the, what we know about um, the first century Palestine and the view of the, the, the Hebrew Bibles, Hebrew Bible, Jesus knew the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible, the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. In fact, in 4, he says um, the law and the prophets and the psalms. There are this three-fold division of the various books that make up um, the Old Testament. That shows us that the Jewish canon by the first century is 
becoming stabilized. At least the books of the law are pretty much agreed upon, and the former and latter prophets, the historical, what we consider the historical books and the prophets, are pretty much um, stable. The real question is what books belong to the writings. We can tell that that's still in flux in the first century. The Septuagint, which was the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, um, made in the second century before Christ, has all the Old Testament books, plus uh, a few others. Um, it has verses like Maccabees, it has Wisdom Solomon, it has a whole bunch of books that belong to the writings um, that do not belong, in addition to Samuel, uh, the writings that do not belong to what we consider the canonical Old Testament. So, it's interesting, the Bible of the early church, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, includes books that, that no longer appear to be part of the Old Testament canon. Um, Qumran has also most of the books of the Old Testament, in fact, all of them except Ruth. So we know that there was a Jewish library, a Jewish sect out in Qumran that were copy, copyists and scribes, and they had a copy of um, all of the books of the Old Testament except for Ruth, so that's pretty big. Um, and really, by 90, after the destruction of the Jewish Temple, by 90, the rabbis who come together in Jamnia and sort of start school um, uh, are pretty much stabilizing the law, the prophets, and the writings into those that we know. But this this process really of canonization, if you want to call that, of of the Jewish he or the Hebrew scriptures really was not analyzed until the second century BC. So, um, really, when we're looking at the emergence of the early Christian movement, we have a, um, a situation in which the Hebrew canon is pretty settled in terms of the law and the prophets, but still is in us into writings. And of course, the Greeks, the the, the New Testament um, writings, you know, are are emerging in this period, but really not canonized. Um, until uh, the fourth century, as we talked about in the other lecture. Now, when you look at the Torah, the Torah, of course, makes up the first five books of the Old Testament. That's a central book upon which all Jews can agree um, is the basic covenant um, that they live by. You know, the covenant that God made um, with Abraham, the covenant that God makes with Moses, the covenant that God um, um, with the people and informing the people calling the people out, making them special. Um, that's really where we find this, this important covenant, giving them the tamas to live by, um, but also giving them um, the laws they need to live by, the purity laws that they need to maintain in order to have God's presence with them. And those purity laws are very important for Jewish life, both in Judea, but also in um, the Greco-Roman cities where you found um, small Jewish enclaves in this period. Um, they made their own purity. They, they didn't eat pork. They, they, they uh, maintained the traditions of the Sabbath, which was distinctive from um, uh, other Greco... I mean, think about that. In the, in the Greco-Roman period, um, the Jews were the only ones who were maintaining Sabbath. So they were the only ones who had a weekend. Everyone else worked all the time, right? So, But they took that, that Sabbath that Friday evening series where they had their prayer and their Saturday where they did not work. So they, they maintained their own lifestyle, even in um, these big cities like Rome and Alexandria. Um, and they had, you know, sort of their own, own enclaves, their own uh, ghettos, as it were, where they lived. And, and, and uh, they were just... So the purity laws um, are important there, those books. And we find that other... Um, Works are commenting on the on the purity laws, particularly in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have a whole bunch of commentaries on how to maintain ritual purity. Um, of course, the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls were very deeply interested in that because they believe that all the other Jews in in in, in Roman Judea were not maintaining um, proper uh, um, holiness, and 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 so that was part of the reason that they went out. Um, in the desert in order to maintain that. So so the Torah was was central for, I think, all groups of Jews, whether, whether in Judea or the, the, the various groups that we find um, in uh, Rome, um, um, Judea at the time. 
Right. Now, another very important um, element for the Jews was the Second Temple, um, Second Jerusalem Temple. The first temple, the, the temple of the Hebrew Scriptures, was built by Solomon um, and destroyed uh, when the Jews were taken into exile in the sixth century in 587. The second temple was rebuilt. Built, not on a grand scale, but rebuilt in the 6th century when the Jews returned from the exile. Um, and then was completely renovated or rebuilt by Herod in the 1st century. Um, and at that point, it becomes this grand, grand um, uh, structure known as, as one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was huge. huge. Um, and you can see how it's kind of a temple must have dominated um, Jerusalem. They say that, 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 that in the period of um, Herod's temple, the streets of Jerusalem flowed with blood because of all the sacrifices um, that were being made um, down here um, in, um, in, you know, at, at the altar place um, around, uh, you know, here where they would make the altar, and the blood would just flow out, you know, of this, of this place. Um, that may be an exaggeration, but 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 certainly people have come from the world. If you were a Jew, if you being Jew and lived in Alexandria or Alexandria or Rome, you would at least once in your lifetime try to make a uh, a trip to to make a sacrifice at the temple. Um, if you lived in Judea itself or in the land of Israel, um, maybe once yearly you would go up for a festival and you would make sacrifices there and you would meet with your family and. And, and celebrate. It was so large, in fact, that you had a whole um, garrison of Roman soldiers um, in the fortress that was built in the temple. And these soldiers would patrol along the top of the temple walls um, and make sure that it was being maintained because people would come from all over. Sometimes they would agitate the crowds. Um, there's a story of a soldier mooning the people, uh, people below, and, and it's causing riots for days at a time. There's still soldiers, Roman soldiers, putting up their standards. Uh, and so, the, you know, idolatry, people would just oh, get very upset. But, you know, you can, you can see all the various places. The Gentiles could actually come into the court of the temple here um, and, and view what was going on. And so people from all over would come. Um, a Jewish... Um, Hebrew people could enter as far as here. This is the court of the women, the court of Israel, where the women could come. They could come as far. Men could come up closer, and only the priests could go back here um, uh, along the altar, and only the high priests could go in the holies, the holies in, inside. Um, so um, this this was a, you know a, a huge um, 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 building um, and. Uh, tremendous. It was also a place where um, there was a large bank. And, um, people could deposit money and it would be kept safely there. There was a treasury underneath. Um, uh, temples were often served that function in the ancient world that they were banks and places for economic transactions. And the Jewish Jerusalem temple was, was no exception to that. Um, and, of course, if you're reading from Places like Alexandria or Babylon, people needed to change money. So out, um, out here, um, in the out here in the in the courtyards, um, people would um, people would be um, um, or or in the porticos, people would would take their money and they would change it, um, exchange it so that they could buy um, the uh, sacrifices that they needed to to purchase. Um, so, because you wouldn't want to carry a, a, a dove or something like that all the way from from um, uh, from uh, you know from um, you know wherever you were coming. Judea was a um, small land in um, in 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 relationship to the entire. Roman Empire, and was considered not a very important one. Um, and you can tell here it's on the outskirts, very far away from Rome. So um, it's a very interesting um, um, situation because the Romans didn't really regard Judea 
very highly. Um, they only maintained it so that they could keep the trade routes the, uh, from Egypt up north, and Egypt was the breadbasket of the ancient world. Um, and, and, and the Romans just didn't like the Jews, they didn't like this landscape, and because of the history of the period, there's a tremendous tension between the Jews and their Roman overlords. Uh, and my next lecture, I kind of want to talk a little bit about that tension and um, the political issues that were going on, the, the history, political history of Judea. Um, and then in the third lecture, I'll talk briefly about the various groups um, in Judea itself. So um, I'm going to stop here with this first little mini lecture, um, and then uh, we'll start with the next one.